And so today, it's my pleasure really to be able to tell you about the early result from Irosita, a new X-ray telescope in operation since about three years. Um, okay, let me start with an outline outline of my talk. So I will I will of course start with an introduction of why we built Irosita, uh, what of course are the main technical characteristics of the instrument and also about the uh, mission status and operations and uh, milestone. Uh, I will then move to a few highlights from the very early phases of our mission, the so-called performance verification, which gives a taste of the science we plan to do and we are doing with the Rosita. But then the, I will move to the main topic, which is also the main uh, program of the Rosita, which is performing a survey of the entire sky. And so I will use the old sky survey data and images a little bit as a pedagogical introduction into the X-ray sky, discussing both uh, very large scales, foreground and background emission, and also um, the kind of inventory of X-ray sources that we are putting together with our catalogs, and also some aspect of the time domain component of our survey. And in the course of this presentation, I will present a few highlights of what I consider probably the most exciting new results that have come out of Rosita so far. And here is a list of a few interesting, mostly of these have been led by PhD students. So it's also, uh, I think, a good uh, demonstration of how this is an active uh, young field. In fact, I don't know how many of you are uh, expert X-ray astronomers. I know some, a uh, few of you, but you know the X-ray sky is very rich. And when you perform a sensitive old sky survey, you are going to inevitably be covering almost all domain of astrophysics from stellar, uh, the stellar the physics of stellar coronae and uh, magnetic field around stars, uh, all the way to the largest the large scale structure uh, as traced by clusters of galaxies. Uh, in fact, you know, in, in, in the era of wide and deep X, uh, survey in general, uh, having the X ray component of the view of the sky provide a unique uh, angle on what is called the hot and energetic universe. Um, in fact, we know that uh, most of the baryons in the universe are in form of a warm, hot, X-ray emitted tenuous phase. So for sure, it's an important window into the uh, overall baryon budget of the universe. Um, on top of that, uh, we also know that the nodes of the large scale structure that are populated by clusters of galaxies, though the most massive structure in the universe, are copious X-ray emitters. And so if you could detect the emission coming from uh, these structures, then you have a way, as I will explain in a second, to study the cosmology itself. And then of course, there is also the more traditional domain of X-ray astronomy in terms of very energetic uh, and compact sources, uh, most notably uh, compact remnants like neutron stars and black holes of all masses, uh, including the black holes in the nuclear of galaxy. So it's a very rich uh, inventory. But uh, one point which I added here at the end is that um, until now, the compromise between covering wide area and, and having sensitive telescope was always geared towards uh, narrow field instruments. So the most powerful X-ray telescope, notably Chandra, uh, and XMM Newton uh, have too small a field of view to provide a, a universal coverage over large parts of the sky. And this is more or less the main motivation of Irosita. Uh, formally, the, the main goal with which we went to the funding agency to get the money to build Irosita was had to do with cosmology. And here is an illustration of the point I just made in a, a second ago. Uh, um, so here on the left, you see uh, narrow slices through dark matter distribution from actually very old uh, uh, simulation from the late 90s. Um, and the main point here, you see that these simulations have different uh, uh, cosmological parameters. You don't even have to remember exactly what these 
now defunct uh, cosmological model stands for. But the main message is that if you adjust your parameters, so in order to have a qualitative match of large scale structure of redshift zero on the, on the right hand side, you get very different uh, um, evolution with time if you look backwards in time is the same uh, that is shown in this diagram on the bottom right from a review from again the early 2000 from Rosati et al that shows the number density of uh, clusters above a given mass or so cumulative number density normalized to their value of redshift zero as a function of redshift and different color line represent different cosmologies and here you see this is a logarithmic scale right so if you can do the simplest experiment of go and count clusters and measure their mass, of course, which is not that trivial. But if you can go and count clusters up to a relatively modest redshift of, let's say, 0.5 to 1, then you have a huge leverage over cosmological parameter. This is because clusters are uh, populating the exponential tail of the dark matter halo distribution. So in a sense, they are exponentially sensitive to the growth of structure. So the, the Irosita instrument, it's uh, sensitivity and it's uh, PSF. So we're, we're designed specifically with the goal, goal in mind to detect a very large number of clusters up to redshift one. Uh, we had this magic number of 100,000 from quite, quite simple statistical arguments that um, if you have a sensitive enough instrument that can resolve the cluster in the sky because they are extended, then you can have a so called stage four cosmology experiment which is what we went and built. So of course we were successful in our funding proposal to the German Space Agency and Max Planck Society. And this is now a picture of the hardware in the very final stage of the build of the construction at MPE. Um, here you see a picture on the left. This is the telescope system. So it, it's, um, uh, Irosita is not a single telescope but it's an array of seven identical telescope that inherit XMM Newton technology in the way you focus X-rays onto your detector, you use the so-called Volter uh, one um, low grazing incidence technology, so classical standard X-ray telescope technology with uh, a mirror of relative lightweight, and uh, altogether the collecting area of the seven telescope is almost the same as the one of XMM Newton at one kV. So it's a very big telescope. Uh, differently from XMM Newton, we have a shorter focal length, a faster telescope with a larger field of view. The, the field of view is about one degree in diameter. So that's a very important metric that I will ex exploit later. In terms of optics, uh, again, we are XMM light instrument, which has about 18 arc second alpha energy width. So this is more or less the, the, the size of your PSF on axis. That then, of course, if you've seen this image from our test campaign, how the, P how the PSF gets worse and worse as you move away from the optical axis of the telescope. This is an unavoidable consequence of the way the mirror focused the X-ray. So when you have the you, you measure your uh, PSF average over the field of view, you get something like 30 arc second half energy width on average. Uh, this corresponds, roughly speaking, to about 15 arc seconds full width of maximum. And for uh, sufficiently bright sources um, that allow you to position them in the sky to about four to five arc second. So it's not as good as Chandra, which is sub arc second position accuracy, but I think it's good enough to allow you to identify the counterparts of your source with little ambiguity. One other point, which is very important, uh, you, you see the image on the left, there are these so-called spiders. They uh, hold a baffle which stands in front of the mirrors. And this is very important to suppress ray light because in this way of focusing X-rays, you may have unwanted reflections uh, that can cause uh, additional diffuse background. Because we want to do a uh, high sensitivity image of these diffuse sources, it's very important to reduce ray light. And this is achieved by our buffer to more than 90%. On the right, you see the focal plane. So seven mirrors means also seven cameras. These are the workhorses of Irosita. These are also in a technology inherited from XMM Newton. Uh, the PN uh, detector on XMM is the most powerful one. And we have improved it with a number of uh, improvements. You, 
that I don't have the time here to go into the detail, but uh, suffices to say that we have in total a million pixel, uh, about a million pixels in these seven detectors. They are all looking at the same part of the sky. And our uh, CCDs are able to measure energy of a photon accurately. And so, in fact, when you do X-ray imaging, you are doing spectroscopy at the same time with moderate spectral resolution. So we have a, a spectral resolution of at 1.5 kilo electron volt, about 80 EV. So it's kind of resolution 20, which is almost a factor of two better than XMM Newton. So the spectroscopic power of Virozita is also quite unique. This is again to illustrate this uh, large effective area. This is the effective area as a function of energy. In blue, you have XMM Newton. In red, you have Rosita. So in the soft energy range uh, here, I lighted here between, let's say, 0.3 and, and 2.3 kV, uh, the Rosita 7 telescope together are almost as big as XMM Newton when you combine the three detectors. So it's basically the largest um, soft X-ray telescope existing now. But then, of course, because of our short focal length, we cannot compare compete with XMM Newton at high energy. So it's a gear towards lower energy, which is where most of the cluster emission comes from. So this comes from our cosmological goal. OK, now this is a picture of the fully completed hardware. Here you see Rosita in its cover. Uh, this was taken in Baikonur just a couple of days before launch. Here, what you see here is another X-ray telescope. It's called Mikhail Pavlinsky artex -C. This is an harder instrument. It works at energy above 4 kilo electron volt, up to 15, 20. Um, but this is a PI instrument of the Russian Academy of Science, and uh, I will not discuss. Uh, we don't have access to those data, so I will not discuss it, but it's taking data simultaneously with the Rosita. Uh, this is a picture taken a few minutes after the launch from Baikonur. It was a perfect launch, happened in July 2019. And the rocket plus the uh, booster deliver uh, spectrum Röntgen gamma, which is the name of the mission Erosita plus Artex-C, into this highly elliptical orbit, halo orbit around L2, which is now a very popular place to be for a survey instrument because of its very stable thermal environment. Um, so the programmatics was that we launched, as I said, in July. In a couple of months' time, we reach uh, this orbit around L2. In this period, we commission our instrument, and we started the calibration and performance verification series of observation in uh, October 2019 until more or less the end of 2019. And the data of this period, so-called CalPV phase, have been released to the public one year and a half ago, in July 2021. You can access this data via MP website, and now you can also navigate through them through your favorite platform like ESA Sky or the NASA High Energy Archive. In December 2019, we started our All Sky Survey, which, I, as I told you, is the main goal of the mission. And because of geometrical consideration that I will describe in more detail later, it takes about six months for uh, SRG to scan the entire sky. So if from uh, December 2019 until February of this year, we performed four all sky survey. We completed scan, completely scanned the sky for four, and, four times and a little bit. Uh, and of course, we had the plan to do it eight times. And this is still our scientific plan to have eight all sky surveys that when you combine, give you the sensitivity that you need to detect these famous 100,000 clusters. And the original plan was to follow this survey with a pointed phase, uh, having some time uh, open for uh, guest observer from the community. But um, as you may know, uh, after the start of the Ukrainian war and the invasion of Ukrainian, we uh, stopped. Uh, the data taking phase. We suspended it, so we put Erosita into safe mode, given the recommendation from our government. And Erosita has been in safe mode since February. Safe mode means that the cameras are off, but the main computer is on, the thermal system is on, and we have, uh, we can control the health of the instrument to some extent. So we, we, 
Uh, at the moment, we still don't have a, an exact uh, plan to start science operation again, but we hope that the circumstances will allow us to do that as soon as possible. But so everything I'm going to tell you about uh, comes from the data that we have accumulated over about two and a half years of operations from these surveys. And I will show you that this is more than enough to do a lot of interesting science. This is again, uh, now I'm starting moving towards our early performance verification observations. And this is to illustrate one extra point which makes uh, uh, a difference with, with the way other extra instruments have been observing the sky. Here you see the comparison of the Rosita field of view with the field of view of XMM Newton and Chandra, just to emphasize again the advantage of having this large field instrument. Um, on top of that, we have developed for Erosita observation a way of uh, observing the sky with the scanning mode. So if you want to cover a large field, instead of doing point and stare, which is not quite efficient, you can let the telescope move in a raster scan back and forth, right? And uh, this will allow you to produce very uniform, high fidelity, high quality images over very large areas of the sky, which has never been done before in X-rays. So the one of the first, maybe the second observation that we did in PV was this very large wide field of about uh, five uh, degrees or maybe 10 square degrees in total centered on this system. This is an X-ray image from Irosita. Uh, of the system of three interacting clusters of galaxy, Abel 3391, 3395. Uh, and almost all the white dots you see are supermassive black holes from distant AGN. And so this uh, is the kind of images that you can study with Irosita. And uh, let me just emphasize the power of that, right? This is the same X-ray image in the 2.2 to 2 kV energy range, the sensitive area of Irosita. This is now been wavelet filtered to emphasize the extended emission. So you see that there are these uh, very interesting system of merging clusters. And here you see in, encircled in red a number of other extended sources in the same field that we didn't know about before, but because we could cover in just one image this large scale structure around these clusters, we have discovered a number of uh, groups or smaller cluster at the same redshift of the main cluster. So basically we are in one image, we are looking at the forming large scale structure thanks to our sensitivity in the soft energy band. And here you see again, the same field is now an image in which we have stretched the color scale. So to emphasize the detection in blue of excess emission uh, all the way from this northern group, this whole northern clump, to this so-called little southern clump. These are all groups at the same redshift of this merging cluster. So this is more than 15 megaparsec structure. So we are detecting emission from the, if you want, the filament or the forming large-scale structure over uh, several megaparsecs. So this is kind of a pictorial illustration of our scientific goals. This is two more uh, beautiful images from our performance verification data that are available for you to play with. On the left, it's a cluster of galaxy. This is the Erosita image. This is called a cluster called Abel 3266. It's a very bright one. If you look carefully, you see that the emission from the cluster is quite disturbed. Here you see uh, a map of the entropy. Essentially, you can measure density temperature from the gas directly from the spectra that you obtain from Erosita, and, uh, and then uh, reconstruct uh, a map of the entropy that shows very well the highly disturbed nature of this merging cluster. Here on the right, um, you see uh, another field. Now it's a completely different science topic. The bright source at the center is a neutron star, and we stared at this neutron star for 100 kiloseconds, so let's say one day and a bit, more than 24 hours. Um, and in the process, of course, because of the large field of view, we detect a lot of sources in the field, including a lot of transients that are highlighted by these white arrows, because the X-ray sky is very dynamic, so there are a lot of sources that come and go. Here you see the accumulation of the photons in this 100 kilosecond. Of course, the central source is a known neutron star. It's very bright. It's one of the famous naked neutron stars, so 
we can obtain the fantastic quality of X-ray spectra. Here is a combination of Irazita with XMM neutral and Mustar that give you a fantastic uh, quality signal um, on the spectrum. And the main motivation why we look at that was to look for um, um, disturbances in the atmosphere. So what you see here is a time result spectra on the top uh, fitted with a simple black body plus power law. And here you see in red and blue, uh, a phase dependent uh, absorption and emission line. So you clearly see that the spectrum needs some extra component. So you can add either a Gaussian absorption or, uh, uh, sorry, a Gaussian emission or an emission and an edge. And so the interpretation of this data is still unclear, but clearly we have a very good sensitivity to the soft X ray band that reveal phenomena from the atmosphere of this neutron star. The largest investment of time during our performance verification phase was this field called EFETS, which is a, 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 an a unconspicuous equatorial field with no particular famous source in it that we just took because of the presence of very good multi-wavelength data. And we stared at this field for four days. The field is about 140 square degree. And in four days, you reach the depth that we expect to reach at the end of the old sky survey. So this gives you a preview of how the uh, X-ray sky will look like when we have completed this eight old sky survey program. And of course, we have used this field to train our uh, software, our ability to, to identify counterparts. And uh, for example, this is a color color plot of the counterparts of the more than 20,000 X-ray sources that we have detected in this field. These are more or less the source that makes the most of the X-ray background. And here, this uh, is an uh, optical color, G minus R in the X-ray band versus Z minus W1, and this Y is in the Y axis. And here it's a, a nice color color plot because it separates very well stars in red from extragalactic objects in blue. Um, and uh, in the extragalactic, so uh, among the stars, we have a large number of them. We can study, for example, the HR diagram uh, this is in Gaia colors of the X-ray detected stars. This is an interesting population of uh, magnetically active coronal emitting stars. The extragalactic population, on the other hand, is dominated by active galactic nuclei, and we can detect objects up to redshift six in this field. This is a spec Z and photo Z redshift distribution based on the rich multi-wavelength data. Just this is to illustrate that. Uh, we are building up statistics for studying AGN population with unprecedented numbers. And then we did out something else also in this EFETS field. This is now a spectrum of the diffuse emission. So we have all these thousands of sources. You can remove the sources, but you have a lot of photons in the background, right? So in fact, what we are looking here is the spectrum from the five camera of the diffuse emission, which come mostly from the foreground in our Milky Way. Uh, here you see a few things. The dashed line represents the instrumental background, which is a mix of particle background at high energy and detector noise at low energy. You see that at low energy, the detector noise dominates. And so for the sake of this uh, presentation, I'm gonna tell you what we have learned by excluding the part of the spectrum where the background dominates. So let's say between about 0.3 and 1.5 kV, our signal is entirely dominated by foreground. Uh, you see very clearly emission line from oxygen seven, oxygen eight, neon six, and carbon six. This is uh, diffuse emission in the CGM of the Milky Way, right? And because we have such a fantastic statistic, you can combine all the telescope. Uh, uh, and we can fit the spectrum very accurately. And in fact, here you, you, there are six components that you need to fit the spectrum, all of them with high statistical significance. Well, let's say five plus one. Uh, here in purple is the cosmic X-ray background that dominates above one kV. This is collective emission from distant AGN. We knew about that before. Then in red, we have very probably very local emission at low energy, so-called local hot bubble, which is subdominant. But most of what you see, especially the oxygen seven and oxygen, oxygen eight line, come from plasma at about 0.15 kilo electron volts. And this is the viral temperature of the Milky Way. So it's very likely that we are looking at 
the circumgalactic medium, the hot component of the circumgalactic medium. And because we can measure both with high accuracy, the intensity of oxygen eight and oxygen seven, we have a very good uh, temperature determination because the ratio of these two lines is sensitive to temperature. And because we can also measure the continuum very well in the uh, APEX model, we have also abundance constraint quite accurate. So here you see uh, the uncertainty, purely systematic uncertainty on the abundance that we measure, which are definitely subsolar. But the, the data requires an hotter component on top of this uh, warm CGM, which we call Corona. This is probably something at about 0 0.4, 2.5 kV, which may be just hot uh, uh, energized gas uh, close to the disk or within the disk of the Milky Way. So of course, from within, it's very hard to tell. And here in uh, in our in cyan, there is solar wind charge exchange that you have to take into account. We have uh, used time dependent data to uh, uh, exclude the period of time where the solar wind was at the maximum or high. But here you see uh, the systematic uncertainty from including or not the solar wind charge exchange model in this spectral solar. Okay, so. This is done only on one part of the sky. And you can imagine now that what we are working on is studying this uh, diffuse CGM emission over the entire sky. So that we have lots of data to be, that keeps us busy. Okay, but let me move to the main part, which is the description of the old sky survey and a few nice results from that. As I told you, we started in December and the, we complete the first survey in six months, so on, on June 11, 2020. Fortunately, we had very little problems with our instrument. We had some issue with the electronic due to uh, a single upset event from cosmic rays, but we lose only about 5% of observing time. So 95% was spent on sky overall, when average over the seven telescopes. Um, the exposure is relatively shallow. It's only 200 seconds over most of the sky that goes up to 10 hours at the ecliptic poles because of the geometry. I will tell you a bit more about that later. Um, however, when we did the first old sky survey, the sun was still in its quiet phase. So we had very few, almost no background flare from solar activity. And so we, we essentially did don't, didn't have any gap in the exposure of the sky. We collected about 400 million calibrated photons, which is only about eight 80 giga of telemetry. So it's not a huge volume of data uh, in the native way. But uh, because the telescope is so big, in 200 seconds of exposure, you reach sensitivities which are about four to five times deeper than Rosa or Sky Survey. So this is the typical soft flux limit 4.5 times to the minus 14 Hertz per second per square centimeter. And in the band between two and eight kV, even if, if our effective area is small, we still have quite decent sensitivity. Uh, and no, no other instrument have done in old sky survey those energy and imaging survey. So we have detected about uh, um, more than half a million source over half of the sky and more than 20,000 extended sources of which about half have been confirmed as clusters. This number is very big. Uh, so before Itosita was launched, in the entire archives of X-ray telescopes in 50 years of X-ray astronomy, um, we knew only of about 1 million sources, right? So in just six months of survey, Rosita has more than doubled the number of known X-ray sources. And with the latest catalog we are working on, after four years of sky survey, we are kind of uh, um, quadrupling the number of known X-ray sources over the sky. Now this is the very beautiful color image of the old sky. You might have seen it before. This is a false color image of the old sky in eight of projection in galactic coordinates. So the galactic center is at the center. And the color here uh, represents the energy, the average energy of the photon. So the red are for photons between 0.3 and 0.6 kV. The green is 0.6 to 1 kV. And the blue is between 1 and 2.3 kV, right? And there are, of course, a lot of uh, interesting sources you can look if you want to navigate this X-ray sky. Some of these are very famous. The brightest source in the sky, this white eye at the very center, it's not an extended source. It seems extended because it's Scorpius X1, which is so bright that you feel the wings of the PSF up to several degrees away from it. 
but you detect, of course, uh, Cygnus X1, the Crab, Pulsar, all the famous uh, actually binaries are there, Virgo cluster, comma cluster, all the famous clusters are there. So there is a lot of interesting material for uh, tutorials about the X-ray sky. But let me just deconstruct this map a little bit. So if I only take the photons about one to two kV, this is what ima this image shows. And if you remember, I showed you the spectrum of the diffuse emission in EFETs. I told you that above one kV, the cosmic X-ray background dominates, right? And that's why this map looks quite uniform. Well, of course, with the exception of bright uh, sources in the Milky Way uh, and some diffuse emission close to the center of the Milky Way, this is very hot gas generated by uh, hot winds and, and uh, by X-ray binary energized phenomena. Um, but you know, overall, this is a relatively uniform view because the sky at this energy is dominated by cosmological sources. Most of the white uh, extended, well, most of the white dots you see, because this image has been smoothed to several arc minutes to make it more easy visible. Most of the things you see are actually clusters. In fact, if you overlay the map of the Tumas Galaxy Redshift Survey, this is a survey of galaxies in the very nearby universe. This shows uh, galaxies within, I think, uh, a few tens of megaparsec up to redshift 0.02 which is known to trace the mass in, the, in our neighborhood. If I go back and forth, you can see that the mass traced by two mass galaxy is clearly tracing uh, X-ray clusters. Here you see Chaplet, Virgo, the great attractor is here. And uh, so the X-ray map from Irazita give you a direct view of the large scale structure thanks to the cluster we detect. If I now move, sorry, to the opposite end of our sensitive spectrum, uh, low energy between 0.3 and 0.6 kilo electron volt, the image is very different now. It's much more disturbed. Well, first of all, you see these dark lanes. This is because of uh, extinction. Uh, this uh, low energy X-ray gas can be absorbed by dust and gas. And so you see a lot of uh, absorption effects, but you also see a lot more disturbances. Those, these are the energies where this uh, odd CGM would peak. So here you are probably seeing the something that has having to do with the combination between absorption and structure in the hot halo of the Milky Way. And then the intermediate energy range between 0.6 and 1 kV is very interesting because at high latitude of most of the sky here, we are still dominated by cosmic X-ray background, but the absorption is prominent and we see the hotter component of the gas. And that's where, uh, by looking at this hotter phase of the diffuse emission, we made the first big discovery with the Rosita, which is the fact that you see both in the north and in the south, a figure of eight shaped bubble-like structure, which we call the Rosita bubbles, <coughs> in analogy with the famous Fermi bubbles. This is actually the same image of the Rosita in the 0.6 to 1 kV band, with in, in cyan and overlaid into it the Fermi map above one GeV, right? And you know probably that Fermi has detected in its hard high energy gamma photons, these famous bubbles, Fermi bubbles. And here we see that um, Irozita is probably detecting even larger structures, tracing some energetic events at the center. So in, in the discovery paper that was published in 2020, we put forward a simple model uh, while we are still doing uh, detailed uh, spectroscopic analysis of the hot gas uh, based on previous data from Exxon and Newton that tells, tell us something about the uh, Mach number of the expanding shock front. So we model this combination of Fermi and Rosita bubble as an expanding shocked wind model in which the Fermi bubble represents the contact discontinuity. The edge of the Fermi bubble is the contact discontinuity and the edge of the Rosita bubble is the outgoing shock front. If this model is correct, we can put some energetics associated to that. In total, the Rosita bubble comprises about 10 to the 56 Hertz, have an age of few million years, up to a couple of tens of million years. And so you need an energy rate of about one to three times 10 to the 41 Hertz per second to power them, which is well, well within the capability of the supermassive black hole, even in a moderate accretion state. 
And uh, since our discovery, numerical simulation work have uh, now made the prediction that this kind of bubbles here, you see on the right, a, a paper by the Illustrium TNG simulation in which they try to mimic the soft X-ray emission from star forming galaxy in their simulations. And due to the effect of AGN feedback, even at relatively low intensity, they predict that this kind of feature should be quite common. Of course, so far we have the sensitivity to detect them only in the Milky Way, but uh, it's probably a very interesting view into the way the AGN feedback interplays with the CGM that Erosita is opening up. Okay, a few more very quickly now discoveries from the Old Sky Survey. Uh, here I'm showing a few new and old well known supernova remnants that are quite useful to trace the diffuse emission in the Milky Way. So here I'm showing two high latitude supernova remnants, one discovered in the <coughs> Western Galactic Sky by Werner Becker et al., and one discovered in the Eastern Galactic Sky by Eugene Churasov et al. And these were not seen before simply because they are too big. They have about uh, a few degrees in diameter, okay? Uh, more or less uh, two, three to four degrees in diameter. And they are quite faint. Here you see uh, in blue, the Rosita image. In red, this in, in pink, this is a soft, uh, uh, sorry, a low energy uh, radio uh, image from uh, CHIPAS or SPAS at one to two gigahertz that clearly confirm the nature of the source as uh, uh, expanding supernova remnants. And um, of course, this being a high latitude, they are an interesting probe of the ISM at those latitudes. Of course, the, the, the well-known supernova, so these are new discoveries. The well-known supernova remnant is Vila. <coughs> I'm showing this image just because it's very beautiful. This is a false color image from Erosita of the region around the Vila supernova remnant. You see how complicated structure it is. It's very, it's a very nice region also because you have in projection two other very bright X-ray supernova remnant, Pupise and Vila Junior, which have completely different uh, morphologies. One are uh, old like Vila and Pupise, one is very young like Vila Junior, very different emission processes. But here to illustrate the quality of the data, not only in the image plane, but as I told you, we can extract spectra from different regions. So this is now a Voronoi tessellated uh, uh, image of the Villa Supernova remnant in which in each uh, tessel, Voronoi tessel, we extract the spectrum and we measure the temperature of the thermal gas. <coughs> here you see the temperature map. We can measure metals and we can measure how metals trace the expanding supernova remnant. But what I think is more interesting is that if you look at the central part of the remnant, your spectral model require an additional non-thermal component that is quite visible at around 2 kV, but it's only due to the high quality spectra that you recognize it's needed. And so this is actually quite extended, a few degrees, five to three degrees. Uh, and this is very interesting because uh, high energy gamma ray detectors are discovering so-called pevatrons in large number, and they are finding a lot of very extended high energy TV sources. So having an X-ray view of this extended particle acceleration site, yeah, I think it's going to be very important to understand this uh, particle acceleration process. Okay, this is another beautiful image of another nice field around the Magellanic Cloud, um, uh, which also include our first light image. But um, be, um, I would like to use my last maybe 10, maximum 15 minutes to tell you about the sources we are finding, our catalogs, and something about time domain. So uh, we are working hard on the catalog from the first Old Sky Survey because we are releasing our data uh, in, in April next year, including the catalog. So here you see uh, a half, the catalog of the half sky our team has access to. We are, the, we are including sources down to a very low detection threshold with only few photons. We're using simulation, we can estimate the fraction of spurious sources. So you can have a very complete catalog down to low signal to noise with quite contaminated, so to speak. 
that you can use if you are more interested in completeness. Of course, you can have a purer catalog if you restrict your detection likelihood, for example, making a cut at 10. And so you, you reduce by a factor of three the number of sources in your catalog, but then you are sure that you have very few contaminants. Then you can also decide to have uh, a flux limited complete sample. So here is a pure uh, flux limited sample, which I think it's going to be very useful to do statistical investigation of different population. So using Gaia, we are very uh, confident we identify the stellar components of this catalog, about 60,000 X-ray emitting stars. Here is the density uh, plot of the half sky in galactic coordinates of the stellar X-ray emitters. Um, so here you see the number density per square degree. You will reach about 30. Here is Orion. It's a very nearby star forming region. You wonder why is this stellar component not tracing the Milky Way plane? And the reason is that we are looking at relatively nearby horizon. So we are mostly tracing star forming region without within 500 parsec. And this uh, structure here is tracing the, the famous gold belt. And so we can do population study of nearby star forming region using X-rays. And by the way, we have detected in this ERAS-1 more than 10% of all known planet hosting stars, uh, except of the Kepler field. If you look at the extragalactic sources, you see almost the opposite. This is again the source density in the sky of extragalactic sources. These are mainly AGN. Here you see that the Milky Way casts a dark shadow, of course, because it absorbs distant emission, and then you, of course, you are less sensitive to AGN behind the Milky Way. So we have about, in this complete catalog, uh, over half of the sky, we have more, almost three times more sources. We, we are um, working on a catalog of the four Earth sky server with three times more sources. I told you about the clusters. This is just an advertisement of the work led by our cluster working group, led by Ezra Bulbul at MP. Here you see um, the distribution over the sky of the 13,000 confirmed cluster. These are extended X-ray emission that we, just from the morphology of their X-ray, we can distinguish from AGN. And then we are using photometric redshift using known surveys to uh, confirm their nature as cluster and place them in redshift. So we are well advanced to our towards our goal of detecting hundred thousands of them over the old sky in, for, in eight surveys. This is just the number one. But before I finish, um, let me tell you something which is, uh, has revealed itself as extremely interesting, the time domain aspect of our survey. So I, uh, I should have probably explained a little bit better. We are serving the sky by placing the instrument in a continuous scanning mode, right? So the telescope never stops. It's very much the same way as Gaia works or um, most of the other survey instruments uh, that the World Sky Survey scan the sky. And the scans intersect the ecliptic poles. This map that you show here is the um, half sky uh, exposure map after three old sky survey color coded by the number of visits. So a visit is the time it takes uh, is the unit of our exposure time, right? It, it is the time it, stay, it takes for a source to go through our field of view. And it's completely fixed by our scan speed and the size of the field of view. And the visit time is about 40 seconds. So the unit exposure for us is only 40 seconds. Then because our scan are intersecting each other, uh, a source comes back after four hours for about one day. So we have about six, 40 second visits of each source. And then the source leaves our field of view and comes back after six months. This is more or less the dynamic. So that means that we have uh, time scale that range from, okay, millisecond is just the readout time of our CCD. This is the shortest variability we can detect, but the typical variability we can detect goes from tens of seconds to hours to months, okay? And so this is, for example, a collection of AGN light curves taken over several uh, months in the South Ecliptic Pole region, where we have all this large number of visits. So you can build up not a, not really contiguous, but almost continuous light curves. Each data point is a 40 second visit, but you see how many we have. And so you can study 
variability of sources. I mean, this is just for AGN, but of course you can do it for other interesting sources, a uh, large number of them with unprecedented uh, uh, data. Uh, but so far in terms of new discovery, as you can imagine, the four hour window, because it was really uh, almost never explored before by other X-ray instruments is the one that have revealed the most exotic phenomenon. So the first one I want to tell you about very quickly is the detection of the Nova fireball for the first time. So um, as you know, Novae are uh, white dwarfs that burn uh, uh, thermonuclear explosion of their surfaces. And uh, we see them as they expand and, and radiate away their energy in optical UV. And but we have never seen before the X ray flash that should be associated to the ignition process. And this is what we think we saw back in 2020. This is the three images um, center of this nova. Uh, the central one was taken uh, at, at some random moment in time during the old sky survey. You see the center is dark because the source was extremely piled up, it was extremely bright. But four hours before and four hours after, in the same position of the sky, there is nothing. These are only a few photons, right? So this is now a light curve in the X-ray uh, in red, where you see all the non-detection from the scan before, and then this huge flare, and then four hours after, nothing. And in blue, you see the optical light curve. So the source has been rise up to fifth magnitude. So it was a naked eye nova. And on the right, you see a theoretical uh, expectation of the sequence of events that happened from the ignition of the thermonuclear flames on the surface of this white dwarf until the uh, thermonuclear flash and the, slide, the slow expansion of the fireball. Um, I told you the source was piled up. So we knew we were detecting something having to do with this fireball. But if we wanted to get any parameter, we need to model this uh, pile up. And this took a lot of time, a lot of uh, heroic effort by, from the team of Jorn Wilms and Ole Koenig in Bamberg. Here you see our data in red, and here you see the atmosphere model in blue, in dash blue line, which we think should be the appropriate model for, for uh, these fireballs. And here in blue, you see what happens if you model the pile up of your data. Pile up means that you detect too many photons at the same time. So, Two low energy photons are read out together, and uh, uh, you, you erroneously think they have an higher energy than what, because you are basically combining the energy of multiple photons in just one readout. So, here you see this effect, a distortion of the spectrum that you, in order to model, you really have to simulate the entire CCD detection process. But we managed to do that so we could measure the temperature of the expanding fireball. It's almost a perfect uh, black body at 28 electron volt which is almost exactly the Eddington luminosity for this relatively heavy white dwarf. And because from models, we know that the duration of the flash inversely proportional to mass, the fact that we see that nothing in the four years before and four years after put some lower limit on the mass of the white dwarf. So you can go and read all of this in this nature paper. So the second uh, highlight of discovery, and well, probably maybe the last one I'm gonna tell you about, is this discovery of this completely different phenomena now on hexagalactic sources, so-called quasi-periodic eruptions. So these are again uh, flashes uh, that you see in the light curve uh, separated by uh, four hours. So here you see two, two different sources. In red, these are non-detection of the source in each visit. Each, each data point is one forty-second visit, as I told you. Here you see three non-detection, then a clear detection, three non-detection, a clear detection, and then two non-detection. And here you see another source where you have a detection, two non-detection, and so on. Uh, here is the spectrum from Irosita. The non-detection are consistent with the background, and the detection are very soft. All the photons come from just below 1 kV. Of course, we immediately point to the XMM Newton at the sources. So the red is the Rosita error circle. The green is the XMM Newton error. Uh, and we, we are quite confident we're seeing something coming from the nuclei of galaxy. So these are nearby quiescent galaxies. And of course, we follow those up, the sources up, because from Rosita we only have an hint of this oscillatory behavior, and we saw some fantastic light curves. He, this is a nicer 11 days follow-up 
which show one flaring event per day, almost. Flaring separated by about 18 hours. And, for, and this is another of the sources where within one day of XMM Newton long stare, we have detected many flares separated by 2.5 hours. So we were not the first to discover this QPE. There were two previously known ones. The first one discovered by Minuti et al. But we are expanding the phenomenology now. I think we know about uh, six of them. And so we are starting doing some characterization of their different physical properties, right? So. Um, these are, just to give you an idea, sources that at peak reach 10 to the 42 or 10 to the 43 Hz per second. So close to the Eddington limit of a 10 to the 5 solar mass, 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole, but they do it in bursts that last only a few hours. So this is a really interesting new phenomena. And uh, what they are, we don't know. They are probably unlike classical radiation pressure instability because their amplitude is too high and the the shape of their energy spectra is very different from the prediction. But of course, it could be some different way, different instability model that have not been explored so far. Um, what the theorists are now uh, telling us is that this could be associated to uh, emery, so uh, compact objects, either white dwarfs or, or simple stars in close orbit around a low mass supermassive black hole. And this is interesting because I had implications for Miller's gravitational wave background. Okay, the field of uh, nuclear transient is very vast. I don't have much time to go through it. I'm just telling you that if you look at the even longer time scale by comparing surveys every six months, you can detect a very large number. We detect almost one galactic nuclear transient per day. So these are galaxies that have bright X-ray emission and then after six months, nothing. Of course, a part of this could be due to flaring AGN, but part of this, we think at least a few dozens, if not more, are tidal disruption events. And uh, here I'm just flashing two of the most interesting ones because these are repeating tidal disruption events. The one on the left will be on AstroPH very soon, it's just been accepted last week. It's probably the most spectacular one, discovered by Rosita here on the first, and then followed up intensively by NICER, Swift, XMM, Newton, in which we see very rapid drop of factor of hundreds in a few days. And then after 200 days, a slow build up again of a flaring system plateau and then disappearance. And this has happened now three times, actually four, we have data for a fourth. And you see that this uh, burst have a declining intensity. So it's all consistent with the expectation of a partially disrupted star that comes back and gets eaten a little bit time by time by the supermassive black hole, each time it goes back close to it. And this is another one in which I've discovered uh, repeating TD after 30 years. It was a Rosat source discovered in 1993, and then again seen by Rosita as a very fast uh, transient with a very fast uh, decay period. We think it's the same uh, because the likelihood of having two different stars being disrupted within 29 years is, is extremely low. Okay, this is everything I wanted to say. If you allow me in one more minute, I'm gonna just show you uh, a nice uh, tour over the X-ray sky. Now I'm using the data from the four old sky survey combined. So this is just allow me to zoom a little bit more into the maps. This is the same false color map, but now I can uh, show you a little bit more details of everything we have in our very rich and beautiful X-ray sky. This is the region around Virgo. Shapley supercluster uh, north of the galactic center. If we move on the opposite direction, looking north towards the galactic anti-center, we have swaths of Ancuspigo sky. So this is looking away from the bubbles. This is where this Hoinga supernova remnant is. Now we move towards the galactic anti-center where the crab pulsar is. Here is a very old uh, extended supernova remnant called Monogam Rim. This is Vela that I showed you before. This is the Orion. Uh, star forming region and the Orion Eridanus super bubble. This is probably again some uh, very nearby structure produced by uh, many O stars. This is a very prom uh, prominent uh, cluster, Fornax. This is the merging system of and 195 we started from. The Magellanic clouds, LMC and SMC, the edge of the Erosita bubble in the south, and now we are coming back towards the galactic center. 
to this extremely rich uh, morphology of imprinted by um, molecular clouds, molecular filaments, and coal dust that absorbs the hot energized gas from the Rosita bubbles and the um, um, energetic events. And this is now back to the full view. And my conclusions are next. Erosita and SRG has been in operation since more than two years, actually three years since the launch. All subsystems are working with minimal losses and we have completed 4.4 of the eight planned old sky survey. However, due to you know, uh, problems much, much bigger than ours, we are in the moment unable to do science operation and we hope, however, to resume at some point. Uh, it's still the case, however, that thanks to its large grasp, stable background, and the observing cadence, Rosita is opening up new parameter space for X-ray astronomer really across different source classes from stars to cosmology. The completed old sky survey will represent a legacy data set that will be unsurpassed for many years, and we are working hard to bring this data set to the entire world by releasing the data periodically with the first installment planned for next spring. And this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. And thank you for uh, accepting to give this talk uh, in a, such a short notice. Uh, so we will get uh, questions now from the people, let me see. Okay, and Antonis. Hi, Andrea. I don't know if you can hear you. Maybe. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on the mobile phone and uh, there may be a little bit of echo, I don't know. Um, so I don't, I don't think that I need to be convinced that, you know, Erosita is, is a great instrument, a great telescope. It can be, it is delivering great science. My question is really about the future of the Rosita and um, in relation as well to Athena. Yes. So, you know, the, we were hoping that there will be um, Erosita and then like it will be continued, there will be a continuity to uh, Athena, X ray observatory, but this is not the case. So, there, is, there appears to be a gap in X ray astronomy. Um, in the next decay. And my question is, obviously there will be other instruments as well, uh, X-ray telescopes, the Chandra, XMM, or new instruments as well. But my question really is whether, when you think at MP about the future of Theodosita, whether, you know, like this discontinuity and what is happening with, with Athena is taken into consideration. Yes, of course, this is a tough question. Um, well, let me first say that um, let's leave um, the political situation aside. From the pure technical point of view, we have uh, we are talking about uh, an instrument which has no consumable. We don't have any active cooling and so on. So, the, the from the mission point of view, um, the only limitation is the fuel that it's needed to take to keep your the SR, spacecraft on the L two orbit. And we think this may last 10 to 15 years. Of course, I think eventually consideration of funding issues and political issue will be more uh, critical. But technically, we have an instrument that as long as it works, it can last for a decade more, OK? Um, well, what? of course, we, we, we are trying our best to make the legacy of Erosita even more important and, and keep the instrument alive for as long as possible. I think we are still relatively early, in early phase in understanding what Erosita brings to the field and in which direction it will move. Um, because there hasn't been such wide field instrument before. So I think in the field of large scale structure, forming large scale structure, studying filaments, and also this issue of um, not only the Milky Way CGM, but the CGM of nearby galaxies and um, the diffuse emission around nearby galaxies. 
this will be in the long term completely revolutionized by Rosita. So uh, probably there will be new ideas that come out of our data. And also this uh, time domain aspect, we are opening up new parameter space. So eventually this will be used by people that have new ideas for new missions for studying transient that we didn't know before. Uh, so I think our goal right now is to try to keep this stream of new data coming for the community to provide new views into the X-ray sky, new ideas that uh, can provide uh, new mission uh, concept uh, while we wait for uh, Tina. Okay, thanks, thank you. Other questions? Please raise your hands or, uh, or just ask. Okay, can I ask something? Sure. Uh, so about uh, the clusters and cosmology. Yes. So uh, we have, uh, you showed that uh, there, is on, the, there are already thousands of uh, clusters. Uh, so first of all, do you think that um, of course, there should be some uh, follow up. I don't know. I didn't. Um, there is some optical follow up, right? Spectroscopy and uh, stuff like that. Yes. But uh, do you think that uh, photometric redshifts uh, will be enough uh, to do cosmology with uh, clusters? Um, yes, I think the, the baseline answer is yes. And in fact, um, and, and the reason why, why, well, first of all, for photometric redshift, we kind of live in a lucky time because the multiband optical near infrared surveys that are sufficiently deep to provide the counterparts to our cluster up to redshift one exist already, like the dark energy survey or legacy survey. Uh, and quite soon LSST will come and this will be fantastic. So it's not even that we have to plan the follow-up, it kind of absent, happens anyway. And to identify a cluster, you it's easier than much easier than say to identify a quasar or an AGN. You you have your red sequence, and uh, it's well known industry to find relatively good photometric redshift for big red galaxies up to redshift zero point eight or one. And uh, we are still gonna use the data in relatively broad energy beams. So even if your redshift accuracy is not as good as spectroscopic, then you will combine your mass function into relatively large redshift beams. So the main uh, uh, identification problem I think is solved, identification and redshift determination. Nonetheless, we have invested a lot of resources in spectroscopy program like STSS-5 or Foremost, because of course, if you have redshift, spectroscopic redshift, you can do more, right? You can study the dynamics within the cluster, or you can do three-dimensional, you can do clustering of clusters. So these are additional, give you some additional handles on cosmological parameter. But I think the baseline is guaranteed by the existing uh, photometric surveys. And the spectroscopic survey will take more time uh, to realize. To, to, they, they just started now, so this will. This is a again, it's a legacy aspect. We, before we have the spectroscopy in place for all these clusters, it will take many many years. But the imaging exists already. In fact, I would say the most difficult part is not the redshift measurement, but is the mass measurement for this cluster. And for that. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do much if we didn't have lensing information from the same imaging survey, like dark energy survey, upper supreme cam. And these are not covering the old sky, so we lose a little bit of clusters. But uh, at the moment, we are trying to combine the lensing information in our um, cosmology likelihood together with the redshifts. So I think we are in a good position. So let me say, we want to do as much as we can, including spectroscopic redshift, but the feeling right now is that uh, with these 10,000 clusters, probably already one year from now, or, or a bit less than one year from now, we can come up, we, we will have our first attempt 
at, at our cosmology experiment. And then the main result will come when you combine all our survey data. But as a demonstrator, I think within next year, we can show something. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, so I, I have another one. <laughs> I will monopolize. Sure. Uh, uh, and uh, what about, uh, what do you think ab about uh, the contamination from um, AGNs? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, clusters, AGNs, uh, especially with the PSF of uh, Erosita, yes. will this be yes. a problem? Yes. Yes, I mean, this, this is, a, you are right, this is a problem. Um, and I think the, okay, the cluster that uh, are um, our original cluster goal, these are relatively well extended in the sky above our um, PSF size, so for everything up to redshift 0.6 or so, and massive enough, uh, our PSF is good enough. That's how we design it, right? Of course, we know that as you go to redshift one population that are, I mean, we are sensitive enough to detect redshift one cluster. We have already seen a few. Those we know that they, some of, they will be uh, missed because some of them are, masquerading as point sources because they're very compact and they are distant and the surface brightness dimming. Um, so what we try to do, so this is an issue, yes. We try to model it. So we try to, um, well, first of all, to run our cluster identifiers also on all the point sources. Try to have an idea of this contamination fraction uh, for the RH population. But I think you can do two things. One is about kind of simple experiment in which you take everything which you are sure you are not, you are done, not, not losing or not contaminated. Uh, and this will give the bulk of the result, but pushing to a redshift is important because it gives a good leverage to cosmology. The higher redshift you go, the more you can disentangle. If you remember the plot I showed in the beginning, the differences between different cosmological models become larger and larger as you go to high redshift. So we are trying to quantify this contamination level. But in the end, we will probably have to do a very uh, more than that. We will have to do a model of the AGN HOD. I mean, how many AGN within halo of given mass are to model this contamination quite accurately. Fortunately, we have so many AGN. We have hundreds of thousands of them that we can do that independently. But in the end, this you would need to combine the AGN clustering and the cluster property to to really assess this contamination at high range. And, and probably use some uh, deep learning or something to. We are trying. I mean, th this is very interesting. I, I, I this is not really not my field, but of course you can imagine this is quite hot topic. So we do have a couple of groups that are trying to uh, use machine learning method for the detection for uh, as a funding experiment, also to distinguish to be able to have extra lever to distinguish these borderline cases of marginally extended or small extended sources. I'm not sure we have a conclusive result, but we are looking into that. Okay. And I have one naive question, final one, if yeah. uh, there is no one else to ask. Uh, are these bubble, mm -hmm. uh, do they, are, are, is this, this a different thing from uh, the X-ray cavities that we see around the AGNs, is this- Well, these thing? are much smaller scale, right? So- Yes. Uh, so the, the cavities you see in clusters are um, hundred, tens of parsec. Um, and, and these are um, maybe, uh, I have something about the sizes here. Okay, maybe 10 parsec, 10, 14 parsec uh, in size, 15 parsec if they're spherical. Uh, and they are much lower energy. So uh, the cavity cluster, I think, are hundreds to, to 10,000 times more energetic. But I think the, the idea is very similar. In fact, I was talking to people at the numerical simulation. At the end of the day, you inject energy at the center, either in thermal form or in the form of jet. 
And uh, almost whatever you do, you will create bubble-like structure in the atmosphere around them. So if the atmosphere is very dense, like in a cluster and you have a lot of energy, then you have these very large scale bubbles, but uh, the, the processes are not that different indeed. We Here, we don't really know whether there is a jet or not, while in the case of the cluster bubbles, most surely they are inflated by jet because we see the relativistic particles radio emitting synchrotron inside. Here, it's too, there is too much stuff. I mean, we, there is clearly not, they are clearly not completely filled with radio synchrotron. There is much, much more than simple that. So we don't even know whether there is a jet or not. Okay, thank you. Ioannis, do you have a question? Like, because I, yeah, yes, I uh, yeah, how do you notice that? Right, okay. So uh, you, just a very, a very brief one, probably you mentioned it, but I missed it. Relative to the hard X-ray part above 2 kV, yes. I understand there are limitations because of the focal length and all that. Yeah. So I was wondering among this, uh, let's say 240 k AGN you mentioned, how yes. many hard X-ray selected AGN would we expect? And uh, good question. what is the relative distribution more or less? Oh, yes. I, uh, I have the now. I don't have any plot. Uh, okay, we have we have a catalog. I should have probably included that of sources selected above two point three kV. So between let's say two, we we are doing a two to five kV selection because above five our area is dropping. Yeah. We have about five thousand in the first all sky survey, half sky four four to five thousand hard X ray selected objects, right. and. Uh, I think we have a literature redshift or photometric redshift of good quality for maybe 1,000 or 1,500 of them. This is relatively low redshift population, you can imagine. I mean, it's uh, we are going a bit deeper than uh, Swift but, uh, but you know, it's a relatively local population. I don't remember the redshift distribution on top of my head, I'm sorry. I think probably it peaks around redshift 0 0.5, 0 0.3. But I, I I could ask, I mean, we are working on that exactly right now, but the numbers are about 5,000 hard sources. Of course, this is both galactic and extragalactic. Uh, if you look at the extragalactic skies, maybe 2,000, of which I think we have actually 4,000 just from the literature. Okay. But still it's deeper than the XMM SLU survey, I would say. Yes, 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 yes. yes. It's going to that. So it's the deepest hard X-ray survey. It is still survey. the deepest, yes. It's it's maybe not even maybe a factor of two. I mean, I don't know how much deeper than the SLU. is not that much deeper, but it is deeper. We go to 7 times 10 to minus 13, roughly speaking. Right, right. Okay. Thank you, Andre. You're welcome.